All right, so in today's video, I'm going to show you guys how to bring a Lyra weapon in. So under weapons, I'm guessing, let's see, we got a rifle here and a mesh. We're just going to export the skeletal mesh. A lot of people don't know this, but the skeleton in here, uh, the skeleton asset, it's not it's it's not actually part you don't export that a lot of people think that you're supposed to export that that's just for internal unreal engine stuff so you're not exporting that you're just exporting the skeletal mesh that's the thing that you normally import it creates the skeletal uh the skeleton for you uh based off of the skeleton of the skeletal mesh and it's more for uh, sharing up amongst other skeletal meshes. It's more of a reference for Unreal Engine behind the scenes than it is anything. It's not a real asset. So export this. And I'm just going to export it into that same folder from yesterday. I'm not going to export the collision or the level of detail. You can do that if you want. Actually, this might actually have custom collision on it. Let's see. Yeah, actually, it does have custom collision. So I guess in this case, I'll just go ahead and re-export it. But I'll I'll export it with the collision this time. That's turned on by default, by the way. One second. Turn my AC off so it's not messing up my audio quality. So now that you've gotten that exported, we're going to import this into here. So under blueprints, weapons, we're going to create a new folder. And I'm just going to call mine Lyra Rifle, just for simplicity. You can call yours whatever. And then, I'm going to import that SK rifle. Everything should be default. Import all. Ignore the no smoothing groups. Uh, I guess Unreal Engine doesn't export uh, things with smoothing groups. I don't know. Maybe they were never added in onto this before importing into Lyra, but I don't know. Anyway, so we have this in here. I'm not going to go over uh, the whole texture thing. If you want a video on exporting all that stuff, you can go and watch a dedicated video to that. So we're just going to import this. And I'm just going to leave it as it is. And all we really need to do is modify the M4A1. So I'm just going to Oh, it looks like I left that asset in there. I'm not even using that. So I might remove that at a later date. We're just going to copy these. Copy here. Don't move. Just copy. And we're going to I'm just going to rename this to rifle. In actuality, uh, unless you actually need different settings uh, for this, then actually you could probably get away with sharing this in here. So in actuality, I showed you all how to do this with the choosers on the last video. So in this video, I'm actually just going to share the layering settings with the M4A1. That It should be fine the way it is. So all we actually need to do is go into ALS poses under animations and we're going to create a new folder actually and we're going to call it Lyra Rifle or call it Rifle, whatever you want to call it. And then I'm going to go into the M4A1 and I'm just going to copy this stuff over. Copy 
copy here. And then we have these. And I am just going to call these rifle though. For simplicity. And then all we have to do is all right so i decided to start over on that so go to edit and sequence bake to control rig and cr uefn medic and body so once you have this open what we're going to do first is we're going to go into the weapon folder and drag out the skeletal mesh add to sequence add add to sequence and add sk rifle don't if you have it selected, it'll show up right here at the top. If it hasn't already been added to the sequencer, we're going to right click on it and go to convert to spawnable. Then we're going to press this plus button, go to attach, and this attaches it to the animation. It's going to require a bone. We're going to use the weapon R bone to attach it. It will start off with an offset. You can select it and press this uh, arrow to reset the transforms. And so that should zero it out, as you can see. So it almost looks fine. It's mostly oriented. It's just things are off because this weapon is, it has a different uh, orient, it has a different origin. Uh, and it's a bigger, bulkier weapon, and so things are going to be in different places. And because of that, we have to adjust things. So in case you guys were thinking that this project was going to be a plug-and-play project, it's not going to be a plug-and-play project. When it comes to animation, there is literally no such thing as plug-and-play. Uh, until AI starts doing this for us, then, and you can say AI, create me, uh, a Call of Duty animation system. Until that's possible, uh, uh, you're going to have to do stuff manually. And when that is possible, you're probably not going to make any money off of it. So just letting you know ahead of time, whatever it is you're doing, because anybody will be able to go on there and just say, hey, AI, create my game for me. And now there's no demand for people making games. So... Uh, for now, I think we should be grateful that we do have to do this manually because when this becomes automated, uh, that will be the end of, uh, of this. So anyway, moving on. Uh, what we want to do is right here on this track, you'll see it stops at the last frame. And if you move it one past, it disconnects. I'm just going to extend that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an additive track on this animation. This is the animation. You can see the keyframes here. Uh, and we do not want to uh, have to make these changes across each one of these keyed frames. And so because of that, we're going to right click and go to add section additive. Well, this allows us uh, and it's going to make it wherever your marker is right here on your timeline. It's going to make it from that time to the end of the animation. This red line is the end of the animation. And so if you want this to start at the beginning, you need to scrub over here to 0000, and then add the additive track. You can still extend it afterwards, but it's extending it is a little janky. So uh, just extend this end part one frame uh, past the end. It doesn't matter. It, do it can be more than one frame doesn't matter as long as it extends beyond the end that's all that matters because if it doesn't extend beyond the end I've said this before in many videos this last frame this last key frame right here uh, the thing is is if this only extends to the end then the animation actually stops at on frame 29 not on frame 30 it needs to stop on frame 30 not frame 29 if, if your additive track stops on uh, frame 29, then whatever you changed on your additive track will not be applied to frame 30. That's why we do that. So I'm just letting you know. 
So I'm just going to call this corrective and pose here. And I, I did already kind of make a, a hand pose, but I'm going to redo it over again uh, for you guys. So I'm just going to scrub back here to the very first frame. And then on here, and I might change the color of this arrow so that it doesn't blend in so well uh, with this ball right here. Uh, but for now, this is how we're going to have to do it. Now, right now, by default, it's in world space, and it's probably snapped to 10 on yours, and probably 10 degrees on here, too, or 5 degrees. So I always set mine to the division of 360 2.8 because it's the smallest one. I wish they had a common uh, one degree uh, snap, but they've never added it, and I don't know if they ever will. I really wish they would, but they don't. Anyway, so I set everything down to the lowest when I'm doing this. If I do need precise uh, offsets, then I will actually turn snapping off right here by pressing those buttons. Now, when we're adjusting things like this right here in the character's hand, like the weapon bone, uh, I normally adjust that in local space. If you adjust it in world space, it could be offsetting it in relation to his hand because that bone is oriented to the hand. And so I want to adjust it in local space. So don't go too far down. It might seem like a good idea, but then you'll notice that the weapon is cutting into his hand. Um, what you could do is you could just leave it like that so it's not cutting into his hand. And there's some controls hidden behind this little red ball. I don't know why uh, they're way back here, but they are. It has something to do with the character itself uh, and how, like, where things are on it. But anyway, those are the metacarpal uh, controls right here. So I don't even know if this thing has metacarpals. Maybe it does. But anyway, you can uh, rotate this. Make sure you're in local space, not world space. If you do, if you rotate bones like this in world space, it can cause issues. You want these fingers and, and hand thing controls to be adjusted in local space. This is local space. If it shows a world, that's world space. So that's pretty much it. I'm not going to nitpick on any little details here. You can spend all day uh, messing around with this and trying to get the fingers perfect if you want. I'm just trying to show you guys the basic rundown of this. So I've got that in place. And I'm just going to key that just in case. Um, now set, select this global control. and You'll see this arm F, K, I, K switch. Check that. Actually, don't check the one for the arm R. We don't need it for the arm R. We just need it for the arm L. So I'm going to switch it on for the arm L. I'm going to key that frame just in case because this thing seems to like not be keying things. I think it's a bug uh, where sometimes it simply just does not key anything. So also make sure this is blue. If this is not blue, then it will not automatically key. And the last one I didn't have it uh, automatically keying, which is why I restarted it. So whenever I'm moving the hand right here, You'll notice that the hand is oriented in this direction, and we want it to be oriented along the plane that the weapon is so that we can move it easier in relation to the weapon. And therefore, I'm going to switch it from local to global. And now you'll see that the gizmo is oriented along, roundabout along the same uh, plane as the rifle which makes it a lot easier to, and I'm going to rotate this actually like this. And you can pull back on your mouse wheel to speed and slow things up. Uh, by the way, a lot of people don't know that, but you can. And you, you've seen how the, how the uh, hand is moving from left to uh, right, right here. That's because this is too far away. So you'll notice if you move this too far away, the hand will still try to stay oriented to it, but it will not be able to reach it. Uh, so be aware of that. Do not overextend your arm. It will look unnatural and it'll cause all kinds of problems. 
If you have to overextend your arm, then your arms are too short to hold that weapon like that. Just letting you know. Uh, so you can try other ways of holding it. Uh, in some games I've seen where little raccoons are holding weapons and they actually have the butt stock of the weapon underneath their shoulder sticking out the back uh, just so that they can hold it closer to the body so that the other arm can reach the barrel. Uh, that's one way you can get around that, but you have to understand that you can't, you know, if you, if you try to make a little kid holding M M60, you know, like with his hand on the barrel of the rifle, good luck, you know, the same thing applies in here because it follows the same rules as far as anatomy. If you can't reach it, you just can't reach it. A lot of people think that there's some way that you can magically make uh, make it reach it. You can, but I mean, you're gonna have to stretch the arm. I think a lot of people just completely disregard everything uh, in relation to real life whenever it comes to this stuff, but in actuality, some real life rules still apply. So now that we've oriented that, okay, it's doing the same thing. This is not good. Uh, okay, so it did not save that even though I keyed it here, this is the problem I was telling you about. Okay, so I know what it is. Okay, I forgot about this. Sorry, guys. So, on this base layer right here, if you need to switch something, uh, if you need to change these switches, you have to do it on the base. And you'll notice that every frame here is keyed. So, what you have to do is delete all those extra keyed frames and then uh, change it to what you want it to be. So be aware of that. Uh, basically, everybody falls into that trap. I really wish they would fix that so that these switches don't get keyed on every frame. They only get keyed on the first frame, if keyed at all. Uh, it would really be nice if you didn't have to key them uh, on the timeline itself, but whatever. So, so now we can scrub through it and you'll notice something. The hand is coming off the, the weapon. That's normal. We're going to select this other frame again. And what we're going to do is we're going to constrain this right here. Uh, so, what I'm going to do, and I need to make a point of this. What we're going to do is we're going to create another additive track for this. And this is just so that if we ever have to redo this, we can just delete this additive track and redo that this additive track for the constraints. This is how constraints work in Unreal Engine, guys. It's very confusing and it's not intuitive. So. In most 3D applications, when you constrain something, it's just constrained. Uh, you don't have to key uh, those constraints or anything like that. And those constraints persist whenever, you know, whenever you bake the animation and stuff. But inside of here, it actually doesn't work like that. So it's an order of operation. What I mean is if I offset, if I constrain, uh, something and then I offset the pelvis, the constraint is still going to be where it was constrained at, uh, uh, where that thing it was constrained to would have been at before I offset the pelvis. And so it's an order of operations thing. If you need to constrain something, it has to be the very last thing that you do. If, if it's not the last thing that you do and you change something else, you're very likely going to break those constraints. So. Uh, the, I wouldn't even really call these constraints because they're, I, I'm not really sure what you would call them, copy copy location or something or and, and keep offset, but it, it's 
I want to consider it a constraint, not the way they have it working. But anyway, so we can select this right here. And now we can uh, press this plus button and say parent. Now we're just going to select anywhere on the character. And then we're going to uh, say hand L. No, hand R, because he's holding it in his right hand. So we're going to constrain it to the right hand. And you can also use the snapper tool too. That's another way you can do it, but I thought I'd show you how to do it this way this time. So do not press this plus button. I've done that and it seems to be broken. It doesn't do things right. Do not press that plus button. Um, we do want to maintain our offset. And so we're going to keep that on. And now if we do this, it looks like it's not working. Uh, okay, so maybe that maybe this isn't going to work for this use case. Uh, I'll show you how to uh, do that in another video. We're going to have to use the snapper tool. That's fine. So the child is going to be this control. Um, yeah. And the parent is going to be this control. This is the hand RFK control. We're going to keep our offset. And we're going to check these two. So what this is going to do is with its current positional and rotational offset, across all 30 frames, all frames, we want to snap uh, that. So if we press this button now, oh, it looks like I didn't extend that one frame. So you see how it stopped at frame 29? That's what I was talking about. Let me just undo that. I'm having some technical difficulties. So you'll see it is working now. But when we get to that last frame, uh, it's not actually constrained. In this case, it doesn't seem like it, it caused a problem. But um, in most cases, it actually will. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend this one frame. You see I extended it. Now I'm going to snap it again. And now you'll see that there's a, a keyed frame on that red line, and that's what we want. All right, so that was the hard part, uh, the aim suite, because it's an actual animation. So, now we're gonna do it on this. No, yeah, rifle. Let me. I'm going to go to edit, bake to control rig. And I'm just going to leave these, uh, this IK as it is. And I'm going to drag out the Lyra rifle again. Convert to spawnable and attach weapon R. Remove the offset. Now this does have a post process volume, guys, and I failed to mention that to you, but um, what you can do is you can actually select the character in the scene and then go to details and disable post-process blueprint and you can key that. We probably should have been doing this all along uh, and the reason why 
And I forgot about this. It will cause problems. Uh, and the reason why is because you're baking the post-process alterations that ha that are supposed to happen during runtime. You're baking those onto the animation, and then during runtime, it's adding them again. So that would obviously cause problems because it would double whatever the post-process actually is doing. If you're using a custom character, this isn't going to be a problem. Uh, they're using these post-process uh, blueprints, but what they need to do is they need to start having that disabled on Sequencer by default. I don't know why they don't. Uh, it really should be disabled by default uh, whenever you're modifying animations. Maybe one day they'll fix that. So what we're going to do is we're going to select we're going to actually do the same thing here. And I'm going to select this and create an additive track, extend it one frame, and zoom out if you need to, so you can see a frame into the future. And we are going to go to poses. And this is the Oh, I didn't have y'all make a character holding pose. Okay, let's go back to this other one real quick. I'm just going to browse. I'm going to open this one up. And that's fine because I'll show you all how to fix this anyway. So now we can go to open level sequence. And this will open the other one that we were just modifying. And we can select this guy in here and go to details and disable the post process volume on this guy. And then we can save it. And now it removed that post-process stuff from the animation. So that's actually good uh, to know. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to select these controls. But just so that you know what controls I'm adding, it's that um, metacarpal control, uh, bone control, that one, and that one, and this one, and this one. And that's just the stuff that I changed. Now, actually, an IK control um, is going to be in world space. It's not going to be in local space. Uh, so what you could probably do is you could probably change this back to local space. And uh, what you could do is, yeah, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're just going to have to offset the hand, the left and I think in the other animation, I don't think that's going to work. But anyway, after you've after you've selected your controls, go to create pose and just name your pose and press create pose, and you'll have this right here. And I'm going to delete this one actually, so I can show you. It looks like it. Okay. So I am having some technical difficulties here, guys. So I'm just going to reselect those controls, and I don't think I'm, I don't think it's going to help to select this one, but I'm going to do it anyway. If nothing else, you'll be able to see what happens. And save. I'm just going to press Control Shift S to save everything. And I'm going to browse back over here, and I'm going to open Level Sequence. Since we already have this set up, we can pick back up where we left off. And now I'm going to select this on with this additive track, and I'm going to say um, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to select, make sure this track is selected, and I'm going to press the Select Controls button. I'm going to press the Key button. And I'm going to, uh, actually, before we do that, let's try this. So let's go back up to the top and extend the base one, extend the global one, and do the same thing on this one. So we need to delete all these white diamond key keyframes, the white diamond ones, not the red ones. And then we need to key this arm L F K I K switch, since we're going to be needing to adjust that and constrain it. Now we're going to collapse that, select the controls again uh, with that other track selected, and then paste. 
And so, yeah, that, that did exactly what I thought it would do. It's in world space. Uh, now you guys know that that's in world space. And so what we can do is we can undo that. We can say select controls, and then I can hold down control and select that to deselect it. And now I can just paste it onto this one. And I'm going to paste it, and you'll see it did not alter that one this time. It only altered the ones that were selected. And so it looks like on these, we're going to have to adjust the fingers uh, since these are all just key poses. So we're going to have to go back and fix this afterwards since these are poses. I don't know what happened there. I wasn't trying to select. I was trying to drag. I guess I thought I was in Cascader. All right, so now now the hand should be holding the rifle properly in most of them. And because we actually altered the finger pose, it actually propagated to that. So maybe it wasn't a good idea to alter the finger poses. What we can do though is we can actually just remove these keyframes. And it looks like I must have had the thumb control selected, not the metacarpal. So maybe next time I'll make sure to that I'm selecting the right ones. So we're going to have to modify these fingers uh, per different animation. So on the only on the aiming ones is his finger on the trigger. And so what we need to do, remember I told you guys before that on an additive track, any change that we make propagates across all keyed frames. So in order to stop it from propagating any further, um, what you can do is you can just set another keyframe. If you set a keyframe there, then it's going to stop wherever you set that keyframe at. And so I'm going to set a keyframe here. Actually, actually, I should set a keyframe here. And I'm going to delete this other keyframe. I'm going to set a keyframe here. I'm going to set a keyframe here and here. And so what this means is that uh, whatever change we make on this on this frame will affect this frame, this frame, and this frame, but not this frame. And this and the changes on this one will affect this one and this one, but not this one, and so on and so forth. But not that one, not that one, but those. And actually, we can delete that last keyed frame. That way, whatever change we make on this last one will affect all the other ones as well. So, I just extended the SK rifle track. Once you, once you guys, I know this has taken a while, but once you guys actually know what you're doing in here, uh, it's going to only take you about 10 minutes uh, to go in here and fix this stuff. Uh, for me, it's taken longer because I'm teaching you guys and I'm trying to cover all the bases. So normally I could get this done in like 5-10 minutes. It doesn't take very long. So what we're going to do on this one is we are actually just going to straighten the finger out. Like that. And 
now what we can do is select these three controls. We can just say finger rest. I'm going to save this. Now you'll notice that on this frame it's relaxed. On this one it's not. On that one it's not. And that's because, and the reason why is because what's happening is it's actually interpolating between the finger being straight and the finger being on the trigger across all these frames. So on frame three, we're going to select the controls and paste. And now it'll stop doing that. And the finger's in the same place on all of them. And now we're going to make a slight correction on this one. I guess we could do something like that. And I'm going to select these controls and I'm going to create a new pose. And then the same thing on this one, I'm just going to select and paste. And then on this one, I'm going to paste. Then I'm going to select this one and paste it here and here. Wait. There we go. Seems to be, that seemed to be been some kind of bug. I'm going to do that again. So on those, the fingers are out. On these two, the fingers are on the trigger. And then on this one, the finger will be out. And now this one doesn't have an end one changing it. And so we don't have to set that on the last one because it's not interpolating uh, towards a different finger pose. So that's basically it for that. Now what we need to do is create another additive track to correct the hand positioning. And it looks like I offset that, so I'm just going to drag this to the first frame and uh, and do that. So now on this one, I'm going to key that first frame, but on this one, I'm going to correct that hand positioning. So I'm going to change over into. In some cases, neither local space or world space is really going to be very appropriate for this, and it's going to make it a little bit more difficult. Um, oh, I don't have the right one selected. There we go. What I am thinking of doing, though, Is selecting this with that right there selected and paste the pose and it is going to paste it down there but now I can move it into position here and rotate it 
Yeah, that doesn't look like it really helped much, but. Now that's kind of a bad pose. In, in actuality, you don't want a, a pose like that because people don't bend their wrist at angles like this in real life. And so I would actually recommend holding it in a different way. This will be applied. This aim sweep will be applied in mesh space. So the way he's holding the weapon actually isn't going to affect have a have an effect on this. So I'm just actually going to adjust it like this. And place it right here like that. I'm going to select this control right here. This is the metacarpal for the thumb. Or it's the first joint for the thumb, I mean. And I'm just going to get it out of the weapon. Like I said, I'm not going to try to make these perfect here. These are keyed frames. And now we're going to set this as the child. And we're going to set this as the parent, just like before. All frames. Keep offset, snap rotation. We're going to change this to frame one though, zero, 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 one. And now we're going to snap it. And if you extended this one frame, like I said, then it should show up on the red line as well. And so you'll see right away there are some problems with holding it like that across some of these animations. Uh, in this one, it doesn't seem to be that big of a problem. But what I do want I want it to have different poses, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're going to have to do that's going to be problematic. We're just going to have it like that on this one, I guess, but on this one, we'll have them holding it in a different way. So I'm going to go back here and I'm just going to paste the pose. And yeah, I'm not going to try to get that perfect, but you can select that control right there, rotate it out a little bit if you want. And now I'm going to, let's see, yeah, we're going to have to constrain this from frame zero to to frame to frame 5 
what we could do is we can uh, hold down shift and right click on this. And we can actually set this to eight. And then shift uh, left click on it to place it back for this frame. Unless you just want to use that same pose across all of them, but then you know you're going to have that problem with that. And as far as this right here goes, uh, you can grab this effect or this pole arm here and you can move it in or try to move it out like this. But if you do that, it's going to propagate across all of them. So we need to set a keyframe before and after and then that way we're only correcting it for this one frame we have the don't select that yellow arrow that's your root and so we could do something like that I'm just going to adjust this. Now for this, we're actually going to delete those keyframes right there. Yeah, there we go. And that's pretty much it. Honestly, what I would probably recommend you guys do is uh, just separate these into separate animations. Don't try to compile them into one big animation like uh, what I have here currently. So in a later uh, video, what I'll probably do is I'll probably split these up into separate animations. Um, well, in a later update, I mean so that we don't have to worry about that. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to find a pose that's similar to uh, this pose right here for this animation because I am applying this during running. I think this would probably be what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to come up here and set this to IK. You, you will notice that this does change uh, the arm, by the way. I'm going to select all of these controls, the shoulder controls, or the clavicle controls, the hand IK controls, and their pole arms. I'm going to create a pose here. Here it is right here. It looks like there was one with that name already. And I'm going to save this, exit, open this one. Uh, 
beta control rig. Drag the skeletal control out or the skeletal, uh, this gun out, add it, attach it. Create an additive track. Uh, we need to figure out where that gun went. Let's see, let's just uh, uh, reset this. You can select it here and reset it over here. And now it's in his hands. And we actually need to do the same thing, expand to the global control, delete all those extra white diamond keyframes, and just change these to IK controls. And go back to the additive track. and paste it. And you could you could do that or you could just do it this way. So it might actually be better to do it this way. I'm going to go to local mode. Rotate it. I don't like having the wrist bent like that, but mm. yeah, maybe do it this way instead. What we could do too is, well, let's just do it this way because everything's global and global coordinates here. So it's a bit more difficult to do this stuff like this in Unreal, if I'm to be honest, than it is some other softwares. So just so you know, but I mean, it's easier to understand how to do this stuff in here. And I mean, you can, you can bend the fingers. Now the hand does move a bit. Also, we didn't extend this one frame. So I'm going to extend it one frame. And I'm going to select this IK control. And I'm going to select this IK control and make it the parent. Same concept. I'm going to snap frames. And if we select to this one, we should see keyed frames across all the, the entire timeline. And now it's not moving. And so now we can save that. Save. 
So on this one, I've already kind of went over how to set up uh, the stuff on the other one. So on this one, I'm not going to do that because it's already a really long video. So what I'm going to have you all do is go into the overlay logic if you just want to test it. We're going to replace that rifle uh, with this one. And on the animation graph, I am not going to create a separate uh, logical thing for it. Instead, I'm just going to replace those animations on the rifle. with this one. I don't know why what I was doing with that. So press the back button. Back button. And now on the rifle aiming back button, back button and for the aim sweep. Back button, back button. Wait a second. I don't know why I disconnected that. Huh, interesting. But this would actually be changed over to this. Oh, this needs to be um, an additive, by the way, a mesh space additive. It needs to be applied as a mesh space additive. Actually, a local space additive. Sorry. We don't want accuracy for this. We just want it to uh, move the arms left to right. And we'll test that too here in a second. So what we need to do is open this up and set the interpolation to step. On the poses, not the other ones. So if you see that choppiness, I'll, I'll look into that. I think it has something to do with this stuff I'm printing out over here. And the fact that I'm recording at 4K, uh, 120 uh, frames per second. That's what I'm uh, recording at now. And so it has a total on uh, frame rate. But I'll uh, test this whenever I'm not recording. But I don't think that... It does this when I'm not recording. But yeah. And there you go. Anyway, I know that was a long uh, setup. Uh, Two-handed weapons, it, it's a little bit more entailed. But basically, the reason why the hands come off is because when you retarget animations, the uh, the uh, depending on the, the gun, if you switch the gun, then, well, things are in different places on that gun. Uh, if you switch characters and the hands are off, it's because of anatomy. So I've explained to this in other videos, but it's just anatomy, guys. If, if his hand is shorter, you have to remember that 
that these animations are stored as, as rotation, bone rotations. So the same bone rotations on a character with uh, shorter or longer arms is going to place his hand in a different location. I've actually proven this by manually doing this, uh, just using blocks uh, in another video. But anyway, uh, so once you get the hang of this workflow, it doesn't take as long as it took me to show you how to do it. Uh, I promise you that it's, it's, I don't normally do this in Unreal because things are a little bit janky in Unreal right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, once you get uh, used to the Unreal uh, workflow, it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to take that long. Uh, you just need practice. Also, it looks like uh, that elbow should have been brought in and I didn't bring it in on this animation. Uh, so I can actually show you how to do that right now. So if we open up these, this pose here and open the level sequence, we can find the one where he's holding it in a rest pose. Let's see, which pose was it? I thought it was this one. So yeah, if he's holding it like that, then his hand should probably, I mean, his elbow should probably be tucked in. And if I just save that, that might actually fix it. Yeah. So that looks quite a bit better now. And that's it, guys. I'll see you in the next video.